all this is dr mobin sayed from drbean.com welcome to one more show so the discussion today uh, fda vaccine committee vaccine recommendation committee has recommended unanimously both moderna and pfizer vaccine for children 6 months to 5 year pfizer 3 doses over 3 months and moderna two doses over one month i believe pfizer's dose is 3 microgram of the vaccine per dose and moderna is 25 microgram of the vaccine per dose the vote was unanimous there are some concerns that were in the comments uh, i want to go over this with you for a couple of things today so this is not going to be a discussion about how vaccines are bad or vaccines are good i have done my um, comment yesterday with the fda's debriefing today's discussion is more towards the trying to understand what does this mean for parents how do they think about it and what should be the approach and i want to give this up front this notice that i am not neither a pediatrician nor i am eligible or i should provide medical advice and especially for the children i have no uh, qualification of managing children so that means everything here is really just for information and to discuss with your doctor not for you so let's start a discussion so this is drbean.com here is the fda's document this page that i have it open here it has both days discussions and i have this link in my yesterday's video this is the pfizer and the uh, pfizer 6 months to 4 years age this is the document about moderna and i think this is 6 months to 5 years but what they had done was they divided the children in two groups one group was 6 months to 23 months 6 months to 23 months and the other one was 2 years to 5 years then there is some more documentation here there are some news articles as well that are interesting to um read for a high level understanding of it and i'm going to go over some of this these documents but i want to first share with us a couple of thought for the discussion today because i know there are going to be folks who would now come out and say you know what <laughs> this is a pro vaccine discussion or dr bean just got sold out or somebody came with a gun to his head so no this is medical discussion this is very same when i talk about medical injury vaccine injury and then people go and create videos to say dr bean attracts anti vaxxers as if someone who is hesitant about a vaccine or concerned that is some bad thing so my request to the audience here you like the vaccine or you do not like the vaccine this is not a place to rant about it instead let's leave this video as an educational material and if you have anything useful to add add that in the comments so here is the audience that is for this talk those who do not have any small children they actually have nothing to do with this other than there is something interesting that is happening in this world those who do not like vaccine at all look i am trying not to call anti vaccine or anti vaxer because that's a derogatory term so someone who does not like a vaccine fine acknowledge you do not like a vaccine this is not a discussion for you those who do not like this vaccine they like vaccines but they just do not like this vaccine fine in that case as well this is not a discussion for you then those parents who have small children this is a discussion and these links are for them those parents who have small children with comorbidities this is a discussion and these links and references are for you what i've done is i've collected the data together as much as i could or i'll take you to the data where it will be helpful to understand more 
those healthcare workers who are related to pediatric work, this is for them as well, but I think they would already be aware more than I am. And then those healthcare workers who are not pediatric, but still are related, they would benefit from this talk as well. So that is the frame of the discussion today. One thing that is interesting in today's uh, meeting was that there was an emphasis on parents' choice. And that was again and again an emphasis that parents should be able to make a choice. I have an opinion there. And in throughout my whole discussions, whenever I say I have an opinion, I add this that I may be wrong because it is an opinion. My opinion is it's not just the parent's choice, but there has to be a protection from shaming as well. So, for example, if a child is going to a school and if the parents decided that they should not be vaccinated, how are they going to be treated in the school? How are their parents going to be treated? How are the school going to behave to them? That is an important part of it. It's not just the parent's choice. There is a pressure as well. And so I cannot sit here and make a choice for the parents. Even parents, doctors should not make a choice. They should provide the education and then the parents have. It's a very difficult thing. It's a very difficult decision to make. But attached to that should be that they should not, this is a decision for them. Now, this is a stat news excerpt. Offer Levy of Boston Children's Hospital said that the committee agreed on the emphasis on choice, parents' choice. He said that an authorization represents a choice for families. So authorization, excuse me, <clears throat> Authorization of the vaccine represents a choice for families. Choice for families, not a mandate. At least that's what they are saying. It becomes a mandate or it becomes a matter to start shaming the families. That is a social and uh, administrative construct, which I hope does not happen. But here, at least, what they're saying is that here we think this is a choice for families. We're saying here is a new product available. You like it, you feel comfortable with it, go ahead, take it. They can partner with their pediatrician, make the decision, Levy said, if they are in a situation in community where there's a lot of spread of COVID, if they have children that may be at higher risk, if they have family members who are particularly vulnerable, we encourage them if this moves forward to avail themselves of this opinion. Op option. So I was also going to say there that this is really important that we realize that parents who have children who have comorbidities, and there can be two type of comorbidities, those comorbidities that actually put the child at risk from the previous data, and then comorbidities that result in management of the patient, which causes their immune system to be suppressed. For example, with immunosuppressants, corticosteroids, or other chemotherapies, and so on. Such patients, small or big, will need external help. And so there is nothing bad for them to have this help. Similarly, a healthy parent who, who is uh, afraid of their child getting COVID, ending up in a hospital, uh, having a sequelae that may not be the best, and they feel that the vaccine's danger or vaccine injury may be lesser, then it is their choice. And similarly, if another healthy child's parent feel that, hey, I think we will be okay, then it is their choice as well. Okay, so with this, before I provide my opinions, I want to first go here and look at some of the data. So <laughs> I'm going to add an opinion here. In my opinion, Pfizer should not have been authorized, even with one vote. They should have gotten zero vote out of 21. And here is the reason. Pfizer's two doses, which are about three weeks apart, had no remarkable, significant neutralization antibodies at all. And they say it in their own document. 
And so the only way in small children, six months to five years, the only way Pfizer became successful was to give them a booster within two months or at least after two months. And that brought their efficacy a little higher. This to me reeks of Johnson & Johnson that with one dose came into the game and then finally they were stopped. And Pfizer and the committee actually made it very clear that parents should be advised, not Pfizer, it's the committee. Pfizer, I don't think, would do this. The committee said that it is important for parents to know that if they opt for Pfizer, then the process of full protection is at least three months and two doses do not offer protection. So they cannot go for one dose a month later, second dose, and then think a week later we'll be fine, the, the child is protected. They would need then, at least they say two months more for the third booster. And what is still not clear is how long the efficacy will go. So, I, I, ha I have doubts about Pfizer's capability considering that two doses means nothing. So here, I'm going to read it to you. And I thought that Pfizer should have simply kept themselves out of it and said, you know what, we don't have a vaccine that is suitable for six months to five years. So here they said, in adult populations, Two doses of current mRNA COVID vaccines do not adequately neutralize Omicron. A third dose increases breadth of coverage and can neutralize Omicron. The need for third mRNA. Real-world data shows that a third dose significantly improves protection against Omicron-related symptomatic disease and severe illness. Given this emerging evidence, indicating that three doses of mRNA vaccines are needed against Omicron, we studied third dose of BioNTech in children six months through five years of age. So that's what is their background. But if I go to their slide number 26, seven, so here, three doses administered 0 0.2 milliliter each, two doses three weeks apart, and then the third dose at least eight weeks after the second dose. So two doses, three weeks apart, let's call it a month. Then two months later, the third dose. So three months long process. Now, if, let's go to 26.7 here. So here, if you see the data that, have, that they have presented, age two to five years, here, two to less than five years of age, post dose three. And then that is how they are showing their efficacy. Similarly, if you go here, three microgram, two to less than five years of age, post dose three. This is post dose three over here. If you look at the column next to it, which is for 16 to 25 years old, that is post dose two. So for children, they were not able to show data for two, with two doses, so they gave third dose. Here again, six months to less than two years, post dose three. So again, the point is that the data shows that two doses are not useful. Why are they not useful? That's a very interesting question. Are they giving the second dose too quickly? Should they actually just have dose one and then two months later dose two and be done? Instead of dose one and then another dose three weeks later, which doesn't do anything and then a booster? So I don't know if it is a commercial um, decision making or this was a technical or scientific decision making. Uh, so this is uh, Pfizer. I feel uncomfortable with this because the protection time is still three months. Now this is Moderna. So Moderna here, children six months through five years of age. 
And again, we'll go to their 26 and 27 as well. So there are some trials they have. The trials were broken up into two pieces, uh, children from six to 23 years and then two to five years. Now, you might be thinking, why not before six years? Many times, um, children do not develop a good response within the first few months to any immunogen because their own immune system, children's immune system, is still being developed. So giving a vaccine during that time may not incur enough protection because the immune cells are still not a lot in number. So then the question would become, how are then the children protecting themselves in this six months? So many of their antibodies are donated by their mothers when they're born, and they spend some time with those antibodies. Then when, the, when mother breast feeds them, mother can also send them IgA, which would also protect at least the mucosal membranes. And then slowly they start developing their own immune system. So this is the Moderna. Moderna is 25 milligram, sorry, microgram, 28 day, days apart and two doses only, which is much better than Pfizer. And if you then go here in two page 26 and seven, let's go there. Here. So this is the pages for efficacy. So if you see here, this is the six to 23 months, the first the second column over here, CDC's definition, that was incidence rate. So they gave the vaccine and then they observed if they will get COVID. So 51 and P301 definition 37. Anyways, on the right side, extreme right side, check this out. This is the efficacy. Efficacy is 50.6% and 31.5% from P301 definition. CDC's definition 50.6% efficacy. That is 6 to 23 months. I am not impressed with this efficacy. Maybe Moderna is also going to come back and say, you know what, two doses are not sufficient. Maybe we should have three doses. Now, here is the vaccine efficacy. First occurrence COVID-19 starting 14 days after dose two. This is two years to five years. And once again, if you see here, two to five years, Incidence rate, two to five year placebo. Efficacy, two to five year. This is 14 days after dose two, 36.8%. Or with, pre, with P301, 46.4%. So the this data is not compelling. But I think what they also did was they did the immunogenicity or the amount of antibodies and then they said they are comparable to the adult group, so that must be good. <laughs> I, I think that's what they did. But here is the efficacy. Uh, once again, over here, 6 to 23 months, efficacy 50.60 and 31.5. 2 to 5 years, 36.8% and 46.4%. The safety data is also interesting. So let's look at Moderna first. We are here. Um, I want to look at the chest pains and those things. So I'm going to go beyond the fever. This is systemic reactions, fever, headache, myalgia. This is systemic reactions uh, for 37, chills, nausea, vomiting, arthralgia. Then here, unsolicited events within 28 days. Non-serious, 49.3%. Related, non-serious, 16.6%. Severe, non-serious, 1%. And related, severe, non-serious, 0.7%. 13 out of 1,761 babies had severe non serious outcome. Adverse event, events of clinical interest, 
Symptoms of myocarditis and pericarditis were solicited for the duration of the study seven days after each dose every four weeks. A search strategy to identify potential cases of myocarditis pericarditis after mRNA 1273 retrieved the following events. Dyspnea, irritability, and vomiting. No events met CDC's criteria for probable or confirmed myocarditis or pericarditis through data cutoff. I think it is kind of difficult for a child. So first of all, number was small. So good if no child had it. If that is the case, great. If the child had it and they had the the heart ache or the pain in the chest and they couldn't articulate it very, very well, then that may as well be. Anyways, so adverse events of clinical interest, respiratory tract related croup, respiratory syncytial virus, pneumonia, and these are the percentages. Then unsolicited adverse event two to five years of age. So here again, I'm going to just read these two lines. Severe, non-serious, unsolicited, 0.7%. Related, severe, non-serious, 0.6%. So medically attended adverse events throughout the study, 33.1%. Was that 33.1%? Yes. And then 1%. Symptoms of myocarditis. So this is children 2 to 5 years of age. Symptoms of myocarditis and pericarditis were solicited 7 days after each dose every 4 weeks thereafter. No events met CDC criteria for probable or confirmed myocarditis. Then this is these are the percentages for respiratory syncytial virus, abdominal pain, lymphadenopathies. So this is um, Moderna. For Pfizer, efficacy is, you saw that post two do doses. So BioNTech, three micrograms, six months to five years. Post two doses, efficacy, this is vaccine efficacy percentage, 21.8%. Post two doses against Omicron, 21.8%. And then after third dose, it was 80.3%. The question still in my head is how long? Was this two months and two months later it waned? But anyways, if you give a booster, ideally immune system should react and become active. Here is the two to five years of age. Again, post two dose, 32.9%, which was actually very similar to Moderna's. And then post dose 3 was 82.3%. And the Moderna comment, if I go to Moderna here, you would see in the efficacy. Here. So if you see here, this is the 2 to 5 years of age. Efficacy is 36.8%. This is what, if you see here, uh, Two to five years of age, efficacy is 32.9%. And after the booster, it is 82.3%. I think there was a chance for um, Moderna to also say there's a booster, but they had more consistent results. If you see Pfizer is all over the place, 21.8% or 32.9% or 4.2%. So this is six months to two years, 4.2%, 4.2% against Omicron, and then you give the booster at 75.5%. So anyways, these are the vaccine efficacies they have. So uh, I'm going to go to some of my comments. Now, the comments that I'm going to make are my comments. So that means I could actually be totally wrong. That also means you could totally disagree with me, and that is fine. The data we have already seen, you will form your own opinion. Parents will have to sit down with the doctors to make a decision um, and go from there. Here are some of the things. So I think if you have been with me for some time, you know that my caution has always been that with vaccine, there is going to be injury or there is going to be side effects. And we should have a clear plan for how to approach that and how to rapidly get ahead of it 
in how to figure out when to stop or pause or what to do. That we should be ready with every single step instead of being reactionary. It will be a sad thing if the studies come out in New England Journal of Medicine, which said, hey, we saw the babies had these reactions. And then CDC comes back and says, based on this study, we are thinking we should do this. And that takes a year. They should be on top of this. So you would see in my commentary, most of the recommendations are that we should be careful and we should monitor this situation now very, very carefully. And again, I don't have any vote here. So these are just my comments. So my thoughts are the following. Number one, most kids have less severe reaction to COVID. We are aware of that. And, and because of this, it's interesting that there are some commenters in the discussion today who totally said that you are overestimating the risk to the children. Are these vaccines even needed? And then there were pediatricians in the committee who said we are underestimating the risk to the for, for the children and we need to hurry up. So there were both kind of uh, messages over there. So if we balance that out, the balance is that fortunately children react less severely, intensely to COVID as well. But there are some that still react more and they end up in the hospital, some die as well. So hopefully, if children generally do not respond that badly to this spike protein and the N protein and the virus proteins, maybe, this is a maybe, they would also not react that severely to vaccines reaction, to vaccines antibodies. So hopefully that would be a good thing. In my opinion, if I was there, I would have rejected Pfizer for even coming to the table unless Pfizer was the only game in the town, unless there was a short shortage of the vaccines, there were no vaccines, Pfizer was the only one. This is my opinion. And again, I could be wrong. The data for mortality from COVID in healthy children versus children with comorbidities should become available. This, I believe, is the most important thing. And I had this comment yesterday as well. Yesterday, I was a little more angry. This data, here is COVID. Cases don't mean anything because we are not consistent with testing. Hospitalizations mean something because there are if severe cases are going to end up in the hospital. So hospital stay should be counted. Intensity within the hospital, ICU, non-ICU should also be known. And then deaths with comorbidity data, that whole, whole structure should be with comorbidity or not. That should be clear. It actually would serve both parents. Parents with children with comorbidities would also know what is the risk. And parents with children without comorbidities who still end up in the hospitals would also know what is the risk and that clarity is important. So I think that data should be there. It is not there at least so far. It is crucial to create a follow-up and a guidance document for parents. So this is important. I had made the same uh, statement in December 2020. And since then, I have been punished so many in so many ways. And now with children, I'm going to make the same case once more. And that is, there should be a plan. There should be a document for the doctors and for the patients to say, when your child has a vaccine, look for following things. I do not know a small baby when they get chest pain, how would, what are the signs and symptoms? I don't know. I'm not a pediatrician, but pediatricians should know. And so parents should be made aware of so that they can get ahead of it fast. I believe myocarditis like things, although in the data, the data says there was no myocarditis. So excellent. And I hope nobody has myocarditis. However, we should be able to, instead of saying it is rare and then just dismissing it, or if anybody talks about it saying, why are you talking about a rare condition? Well, I know adult patients who have vaccine injuries 
as rare as they may be, they are human beings suffering. Similarly, we should have a plan. So we should have a plan to understand cardiac issues, clotting issues, liver issues. And we should just be very, very careful and we should have the guidance literature available. I know what is going to happen. They are not going to do it because they would say, if we did it, that would cause hesitancy. So fine, if they're not going to do it, which I suspect not, at least create a plan and make pediatricians aware, aware of it, make doctors have a plan. And then immediate reaction, immediate injury is a different thing, a more longer lasting injury, which we have not yet reached a point to even acknowledge that for adults, but we should be able to be ready. Then the question will become the efficacy of the vaccine, the protection of the vaccine. Is this comparable in terms of, let's say, there is a making up a number now. Let's say there is one injury out of 100,000 vaccine doses versus out of 100,000 COVID cases there is X number of uh, long COVID, for example. We should be able to compare those data. We should become enough wise by now. Wise, not wise. <laughs> enough wise by now in two and a half years to put together such dashboards to be able to guide our, our society, our parents, our, our people, our doctors. So a better reporting method than VAERS. I really am not happy that if this, although most of the vaccine reporting is in children and that goes to VAERS, but I think VAERS is not the best thing to track because what happens is VAERS cuts negatively both ways. Healthcare administrations take that data and dismiss it and say, well, you know what, this data is actually not accurate. This data is not properly reported. So it's a mush, it's a hodgepodge. Then there are folks who also take this and extrapolate it and say, well, if this is happening here and it is 10 times more and there is multiplied this with that and, and then they uh, go on to other tangents. So ideally, the reporting system for these vaccines should be much more mature, at least for children. In that, they should actually be a better reporting system from pediatrician's office. And they should have a standardized set of things to write. Anyways, this is the next point also. Don't co-administer this vaccine with other vaccines. Children's get, children get a lot of vaccines. So don't co-administer them yet. That would allow us to observe children with this vaccine to see what are the side effects, if at all instead of co-administering with other vaccines, which may affect each other's efficacy, plus which may confuse which vaccine caused what. And this, once again, a plan, even if it is unannounced to the public, should be there to understand how do we manage if there is vaccine injury. This strategy of this is a rare thing is not the best. One, it is a rarity is a, is a subjective term. There is no data in rarity. And secondly, it is really not counted correctly. So basically, as a society in the US, all we can say about vaccine injury is we do not know how many, instead of saying it is rare. So those who continue to harp on this bandwagon or, or this whatever, that it is rare are actually ignorance because we should have the correct data. And then based on the data, we should say it is rare. Do you, any of you know the count of vaccine injured? So if we do not know the count of vaccine injured, then how can we say rare or not rare? So that has just become a term to shame and attack others. So anyways, continuing. Have a robust plan for efficacy and safety measurement. This should start happening as soon as authorization comes in. 
there should be a plan to say, all right, we're going to see vaccine efficacy and safety over a broader term now. And we are going to measure the antibodies and we're going to see if when do they wane. If Pfizer could not produce antibodies in two and it needs a third dose, then how long did that survive? Same for Moderna. So I had a very different formula. We can name it differently. FKC has a specific statistical definition, so I should not reuse that term. But for me, the FKC will be protection from hospitalization multiplied with number of months, divided by boosters multiplied with injuries. That would be the FKC for me. There would be a ranking scale to say this vaccine protected a child for, let's say, from hospitalization, and that protection was 90%. And this stayed, that protection stayed for three months, divided by how many boosters did we give the child and how many were injured in that process. Safety, number of vaccine injured. Safety is not going to be, in my opinion, hey, did you get a local reaction or not? Did you get a fever or not? Safety is going to be injuries. But for that, they'll have to count the injuries. Continuation of the vaccine program should use these data points. Now, when is vaccine critical for children? Look, those children who have comorbidities, imagine if they are taking chemotherapy or they are taking steroids or they, they have cancers and they cannot make immune cells correctly or their immune cells are not functioning correctly or they have genetic immune cells inherited in immune cell problems. They would need help, these children. So vaccines are very legitimate, very important factor for them. Similarly, those children who are receiving therapies, even if these are temporarily given, maybe three months later that therapy would stop, but that is an immunosuppressing therapy. And if their risk is higher because of, let's say, their surroundings, otherwise they're healthy, then they should consider this as well. Again, I cannot advise it. This is with the doctor's help. Now, for healthy children, there should be parental guide where parents should be able to say, all right, my child is three years of age, healthy. I'm thinking of Moderna. What is the efficacy? What are the possible side effects? How long the efficacy stays? That should be clear to everyone. They can make their decisions. I mean, they're Parents are much, much more vigilant for their children than anyone else. So COVID, parents should know at all times, COVID-related hospitalizations, sequelae, uh, that spellings are wrong, so forgive me. It's, similarly, parents should also know vaccine-related reactions and injuries and outcomes, I could not even write deaths per 100,000. This little dashboard should be available all the time on a CDC site somewhere with comorbidities, without comorbidities. Done. That would be sufficient for parents and doctors to be able to make good decisions instead of shaming them and pressuring them or telling them they are ignorant or, or celebrating in front of them, it's just, it needs to be better. Not just the science needs to be better, but the, the execution of the science also needs to be better, especially in this sensitive area. And as I said before, Pfizer vaccine. So some folks, um, Pfizer said that we need performance. It is poor performance and we need booster at some point. We know that three months. No protection after two doses. I found it surprising. This was Paul Offit, who himself is in the pediatrician, uh, pediatrics hospital. 
third dose and you you all know him more than i do and so some like him some don't that's not the point he said i'm surprised that two doses did not work and the third dose was needed and so the third dose fixed the issue for pfizer so parents should be aware i think this was cdc's representative who said that parents should know clearly that for pfizer they are in for three months and before that the concept of protection is not there moderna two doses and we saw the efficacies so this is a discussion i cannot stop folks from adding strange comments in the comment section but I would like parents to be able to look at those links. Let me actually put those links um, here in the chat as well, just so that you can go over. This, this is for Pfizer. Look at especially slide number 26, 27 onwards. And this one is for Moderna. Again, look at slide number 26 and 27 or that area that is where the efficacies are so then have your child see the data talk with the doctor so with this thank you very much for listening in some of the data some of the commentary um, in one way it is a good thing that there is another option available for those parents who are nervous who have been thinking about their children they have something available for them. Um, those who have comorbidities, their parents have an option. So there is a choice available. But we should be really, as a society, we should be really vig vigilant. So with this, thank you very much. Please uh, like, subscribe, and share. I would see you tomorrow on the other side as well. <laughs> other side meaning th this channel plus we would have the uh, drawing class as well on cafe. And day after, we would be on this channel. Tomorrow, Paul Bork. Day after, Michelle. And then day after, on Friday, we'll have question answers as well on the chit chat. So thank you very much. And if you would like to support this work, you can become a member on YouTube. You can buy Dr. Bean plan. That would be very, very useful. There is a link in the description. Dr. Bean plan is actually one-time payment of less than $100, you would actually be surprised. And there are 900 different videos in here, which are our premium content. So check it out. You can also use PayPal. You can buy me a coffee as well. You can become part of Substack or Patreon. So thank you very much. And I would see you tomorrow. You're very welcome. You are very welcome. <laughs> Rima, thank you. Actually, the the link in here, sorry, you spent 97. <laughs> the link here is for 67. Don't tell anyone. Tina, thank you. So with this, please like, subscribe, and share. The easiest way you can help me uh, get some funds on this is if you like and share if you like as well that would be nice too thank you very much i'll see you tomorrow